Welcome to the Henley Centre for Leadership and to our interview series, Leadership Gems. This is a series of interviews with a variety of expert leaderships, doing a deep dive into leadership and leadership development issues. So our interviewee today is recently retired Major General Paul Nansen, who was commander of the 7th Armoured Brigade and latterly as the Commandant of the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst, the Head of Army Leadership and of Army Recruitment. So I'd like to introduce you to General Paul and today we're going to cover his experience of Army Leadership and how that translates into leadership in wider organisations. Good to see you again, Paul. Thank you for agreeing to do the interview. Um, so the, the first set of questions I'd like to ask you are around your leadership approach. When you look back at your career, when did you first think that um, what I'm involved with looks and feels like leadership? Um, well, I think in terms of my career, I think, I think you sort of start to um, think about leadership at school, if I'm honest with you. Um, I was very lucky. The school I went to did talk about leadership. It was sort of, you know, sports. I was in a cadet force. So there was some leadership. I'm not sure there's enough done at schools, and I think there's probably more leadership education that could be done at schools. That's something I'm, I'm very interested in. But so I think I did a bit of school. But in terms of my career, I think, I mean, obviously when I came here to Sandhurst, um, which, which, which is where I came from my initial training, you know, that's where you first get taught about leadership. And, you know, you, you learn leadership from uh, your, your role models. And therefore the instructors here were very much, you know, the personification of leadership, if that's the right sort of phrase. So, you know, we learned it by example. Um, and of course, we were, we were learning about those who'd gone before us and what they did. So we were learning from 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 uh, from others. But I suppose in terms of when did it really dawn on me that this was you know, serious leadership? Uh, I suppose for me, it was really when I went, went went on operations for the first time, which was not long after leaving here. And you know, I was responsible for uh, 32 uh, men, as it was in those days. It was all, it was all male. Uh, and I went out to, to Northern Ireland and for the first time, you know, it dawns on you that, you know, your decisions, you know, you are responsible for them and, um, you know, what, what happens out there is literally a matter of life and death. And so that's when it suddenly got very real and I realised that actually, you know, leadership is, is, uh, is, is, uh, is a very difficult and you know, difficult thing to do. It is. And... So you went to Northern Ireland with 32 men uh, in your charge and they're calling you sir, um, maybe for the first time in, in anger, so to speak. What did that feel like? Yeah, well, it's interesting because, of course, you come out of Sandhurst and, you know, what was I, 21? Um, you know, you're not very old. Mm -hmm. um, the experience you have is literally six months as it was uh, then here, uh, learning, learning your trade. Um, I'd done a platoon commander's course after that. I, I, I'm an infantry officer by background. So I'd learned my trade, but of course, relatively new in terms of that experience. So you're in charge, absolutely. You have the authority, you have the rank on your chest that says you're an officer. But you have to rely on those around you to provide you with the advice. And of course, my, my, um, yeah, my platoon sergeant was a chap who was far older than me, far more experienced than me, been in the army for a long time. You know, I, I relied on him to, to see me through and he, unfortunately he was a great bloke. And um, you know, he, he, we had that relationship where he would advise me, mentor me, guide me, uh, and hopefully I was big enough to listen and, and take his advice. So I wasn't, you know, although I was responsible and accountable, okay. um, you know, I had help and I think that's the, that was a good approach. And that's in itself a really interesting leadership relationship, isn't it? That you had a sergeant with lots and lots of experience, ostensibly you are the person in charge, and there's this exchange of leadership going on between you. How did that, so can you say a little bit more about how that worked? Yeah, I think, I think it's not just the, the sergeant. I think now, and particularly as I've gone through my career, I've realized that um, you know, the army are very hierarchical structure, we have rank. And therefore, you have a, a platoon commander, you have a platoon sergeant, you have corporals who are non-commissioned officers who, who all are in charge of groups of people, but you're ultimately it comes up to one person. 
So you have this sort of follower leader relationship, you would think. But I think more and more, particularly when we went into operations where you're in quite a complicated environment, you rely so much on, on the team and listening to the device, not doesn't matter what rank you've got, you know, you, you, you will, there will be somebody in your team who will know the answer to the problem. And therefore, I think leadership is all about allowing them to come forward, allowing them the space, the climate, the culture, where they feel it's okay to put their hand up and say, do you know what, boss? I know how to do this. Um, and I think, you know, the art of leadership is saying, okay, Jimmy, you've got this. We'll follow you for this one. Um, doesn't mean you abrogate responsibility or accountability because you're still the leader. You're still the guy with the rank. But for that instance, they may have the, they may have the solution and therefore follow them. And I think that's more and more as I've gone through my career, that's much more the way we have to lead if we are going to unlock some of these wicked problems that we have. So has that changed over time? Definitely. Definitely. I think, I think more and more I've seen in the military now that we have, you know, mission command, we call it, yep. empowerment. We have gotten far better at doing that, of creating the, the conditions to allow people within our teams to operate within boundaries with the disciplined initiative. So they understand what they have to do, not how they have to do it, so that you can unlock their initiative, their potential, to be able to find a way. Um, and, and particularly nowadays, you know, Warfare, envir the environment we've been, we, we fight in has always been complex. I mean, it's, it's always been complex. So it'd be wrong to say it's got more complex, but it's got more complicated, yeah. you know, as more technologies come in and, um, you know, and therefore the problems we're facing now are more complicated and therefore require a different approach. And I think a different leadership approach. And that goes back to this whole business of empowering the team to be able to help you to unlock the problems. Thank you very much. How did your leadership over time evolve, your own leadership? Well, I think it evolves because of the different, you know, roles, um, ranks, environments that you operate in. So I think, you know, the one thing we get taught just down the road here yeah. from a very early stage, which is absolutely right, is, you know, you've got to understand the context of the situation you're going into and then adapt your leadership accordingly. You know, one size does not fit all. I think, you know, some people think you can go and learn leadership and that's it, tick. Done the course, Henley. <laughs> done the course, <laughs> done the course. Uh, so that's me, I'm a leader. Yep. And it's not like that. And I think, you know, wise people understand that it's a journey, isn't it? And your journey, you evolve with, you know, with different experiences, with uh, different people you, you operate with and what have you. And I think that's what I've done. I've been on a journey and, and the army is very good. And I think other organisations could learn a lot from them. The army is very good at making sure that you are on a journey, that you, you have this continuous development as you go through the ranks or the roles, whatever it may be, to fit you with the right leadership understanding to tackle the next challenge. So yeah, my leadership has definitely evolved. Still evolving now, I mean, I don't think you ever stop learning, do you? You don't ever stop learning, that's absolutely true. So what, what did you want or what do you still want your leadership to achieve? Um, Leadership achieved. Well, I mean, leadership's got to achieve the task, hasn't it? I mean, that's that's the you know whatever you're setting out to do, you know, you've got to you've got to win, you've got to succeed, you've got to hit the targets, whatever it may be. So ultimately, I think it's it's about that achieving the task. However, I think yeah, the the best advice anyone ever gave me, I think one of the great bits of advice someone gave me is you know when you start a position or you start a role or you or you enter an operation or, or you take over a unit, you know, try and Try and leave it in a better place that you found than you found it, firstly. And think about how you're going to leave it before you even start. So where do you, where do you want to end up? And for us, you know, our, our leadership chunks come in two years, basically. You know, yeah. If you take over command of a, a unit, it's for two years. So you know you've got time. You know, you know what's going to happen in those, you know, broadening what's going to happen in those two years. And therefore, you, know, you, can, you can set yourself some goals. And you know, I think that's really important. And I think understanding how you're going to, how it's going to end. You know, what, what does it want to look like on day, on the final day? And then work towards that from the beginning was always the thing that I tried to work. And if you leave it in a better place and you've got to define what better place look, what, it, what does it mean? Um, then I think that's, that's the mantra I've tried to use. 
So who do you serve in your leadership? Um, well, again, I keep, I keep pointing that way because that's yes. <laughs> Sandhurst. But, um, you know, the motto of Sandhurst is serve to lead. Yep. A very famous motto that, you know, is, is stamped on us, tattooed on us from day one of, uh, of our time here. And, you know, serve to lead is all about servant leadership. It's all about, um, you know, people passion, looking after your people, mm. caring for your people. And it's about, you know, you've already talked about trust. It's about how do you, how do you develop trust? And, and um, you know, trust comes with caring for people and putting people first. And you know, it's not about authority. It's about how you look after your people. So who do you serve as a leader? You serve, you serve your people. And, you know, I think genuinely, if you're gonna get the most out of people, particularly in our line of business, which is, you know, ultimately going into danger. Mm -hmm. You know, in those, last, in those last few meters or seconds, you know, are they gonna follow you because of your rank or are they gonna follow you because they believe in you as a person mm -hmm. and they like you? Mm -hmm. I think it's probably the latter. So I think, you know, people, people leadership, serve to lead, serving your people, it's gotta be the right approach. You mentioned trust there and, and we know that trust is a big part of leadership yeah do you feel um that the army is actually focused on building that trust um, as part of your training because trust in your line of business must be absolutely essential like as you've just described if you're going into a dangerous situation people need to trust you how do you think that the army helps with that uh, building that trust i mean i don't think we're perfect um, you know, there's always room for improvement, but I do think we understand the need for trust as you've quite clearly articulated. And it goes back to my point about in those last unforgiving moments. And, and, you know, I think that those bonds, those bonds of comradeship, um, the trust you place in the person either side of you in very difficult, complex, dangerous environments, that's what holds it together. That's what allows you to achieve sometimes really impossible tasks. And, got stories, legions of stories of people who, 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 knew, who knew they were not going to succeed, who knew that they weren't, weren't going to come out of it, yet stuck at it because of their mates. And therefore, you know, those, those incredible bonds. And people talk, you know, people talk about the First World War and you know, what made them go over the top, you know, even though they've seen their, you know, seen their mates get decimated. Who knows? But I guarantee you a lot of it was down to the fact that they were, they were there together. You know, they were there with their friends and they didn't want to let one another down. And so, you know, creating those bonds of trust, creating mateship, whatever you want to call it, in teams, doesn't matter if it's a military team or a civilian team, it's hugely important because that will allow you to achieve the sometimes impossible. And that's something that's often a challenge in organisations is to build that trust. Um, and perhaps when it feels that, that, that there isn't so much risk and there isn't so much on the line, um, it might feel more difficult. But if that trust was, was built there, um, teams would succeed better. What do you think, what do you think about I, that? I absolutely agree with you. I, and I think that's probably come to light in the recent COVID crisis. I think the organisations that have dealt best with COVID are the ones that had that reservoir of trust with their people before it. Yeah. You know, when you hit a crisis, then's not the time. That, that is not the time to try and build the trust. You have to have had those. You have to have those strong bonds before you hit it. So I think I hope that people now realise that whatever happens next, and, and we might talk about you know reset. But but um, you know, as we go into whatever the new thingy looks like, you can't say new normal because everyone throws things at you. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Whatever whatever it looks like when we eventually come out of this, I hope people will look at you know resilience bit better and, and, and part of resilience is building those those great trust relationships that will sustain you through thick and thin. The army happened to have to happen to do it I think pretty well yeah. and we can prove we've done it pretty well because we've been doing it for hundreds of years and done some amazing things. Indeed thank you. So how in your career have you been called to enact leadership with your bosses and with your peers? How has that manifested for you? Um, so leadership, leadership upwards, mm. uh, I think, is, is all, it, it goes back to this context business. And I think you, if you're going to be a good follower, and it's a really strange 
term that because of course we're all leaders, yeah. but you're also going to be a follower at some stage as well. So in this particular instance, you've asked me about how do I serve my bosses? I'm the follower. Yep. So I think you've got to understand the context in which they're operating. And you know that, that drives their decisions, that drives what they're asking you to do. And therefore you've got to understand that um, if you're going to serve them best. And that's, you know, sometimes what comes down, you may not like, um, but as long as you understand it, you understand why they're asking, then you can do something about it. And so I tried, I tried to do that. That's, that's the way I tried to build that relationship with my seniors, is try to understand the, the context they were, they were operating in, and then try not to be needy. Because I think you can, be, you can be needy and keep asking for direction and keep you know, mm. going back and not criticizing, but just asking for clarification or you know, why have you asked me to do that or can't do that. That's just not, not the way you should do it, I don't think. I think you should, you should try and solve problems for them. So go back and say, you know, I, I'm struggling with this, but I've got, a, I've got an alternative way of doing it. So give them a solution rather than just a problem. That was a, that was a good one. Um, and, and, not be, and not be needy. So I think that's the way I've tried to work, tried to work uh, up, to, up to bosses. And, and in return, I think, I hope, I hope they you know, don't get the long screwdriver out. They, 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 that builds the trust yeah. and therefore, you know, works, works both ways. And what kind of leader did you like to work for? Um, I've worked with some great, I mean, I've worked with some great leaders, some really great leaders, and we haven't got a shortage of them in the army. There's been some bad ones as well, and you can tell when the bad ones come along. But the really good ones have, um, have uh, invested time in, in, in me and my people going back to the serve to lead business, so they, they, they knew me, and have given me the space and the conditions to operate. And it goes, goes back to that business about empowerment and mission command. You know, the, the good ones have, have, um, have allowed me the space to make decisions and get after my business and not, not stuck the, you know, the, yeah. the oar in too often. Okay. I think that's Stymie's initiative, doesn't it? That's what, sorry? It's Stymie's initiative if people are constantly <laughs> asking. Oh, yeah. What are you doing now and what's going on Micromanagement. next? Micromanagement. Oh, it's really terrific. bad. And we're, 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 I mean, generally, I think we as a, you know, not just the army, I think everybody is, is guilty of it because, you know, when, when the bottom line depends on it, you take, an, you take more of an interest, perhaps. But there must, be, there must be times when a commanding style of leadership, if I put it in my leadership terms, has to take over. Yes, you're absolutely right. So, so you're absolutely right. I think um, this, this is a bit of a soapbox of mine coming out now, but I think operating in some really difficult environments and you know, in one particular environment we were operating in, the word came down from the top to, to do something. And it was a very difficult task. And it basically was just go and sort it out. Mm -hmm. Mission command, find a way. But the task was so complex, we just didn't know how to do it. So one thing led to another and, and some, 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 some bad things happened um, as a result. So I think, going back to your point, your excellent point, yeah, mission command is as much about you know, telling people what to do as it is about empowering people what to do. And it's all about understanding the people in your team. So there will be people in your team who you, who you trust who have got the experience, who have got the competence, that you can say, there's your boundaries, go away, and, and, and I'm happy with that. There'll be other people in your team who, who for whatever reason, new, new to the team, so you don't trust them because you don't have to work with them, or lack the experience because they're new, like I was when I left here, yeah. or just haven't got the competence, haven't got the right skill sets, and therefore they need to be told what to do. And that's where the leader comes in because you know, he or she has probably got the experience certainly got the rank and the authority and therefore they need to be a bit more directive. So I think you know, empowerment, mission command, there's a sliding scale, there's a sort of spectrum upon which the art is understanding where your people sit on that spectrum and how much you can empower them. So something about leader agility in knowing your people, what they can handle, where their boundaries are, yeah. um, what you can ask of them. Yes. And I think, I think that goes back to servant leadership and knowing your people intimately. Um, you know, how much can I empower 
this person. You know, that's, you know, particularly when you're in a difficult position, when you're in a difficult environment, that's the art. And at the ultimate end of that is an order, I guess. I think it is. I mean, I, I do honestly believe, and people laugh and say, oh, the army's all about shouting. But there's a reason we shout. Mm. And there's a reason we shout, particularly in a difficult environment, because people, people take note. If you shout at them when everything's going wrong and tell them what to do, their instincts take over and they'll do that. And therefore, we probably get them out of trouble. So I think there, is, there are times for orders and there are times when you can let people have, have their head in there and let, their, let them use their initiative. And that's, it goes back to my point on that's the art of leadership in crisis and complex situations is knowing how much, you know, whereabouts on that spectrum do they sit. And if you're a bit selective with your shouting, it has more impact. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's, there's a great rule here. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the, the instructors here who are the best in the army, without shadow of a doubt, incredible men and women, but they don't shout very often. I mean, they'll shout on the parade square, but when they're going out on, you know, when they shout, the cadets know something's gone wrong or they're doing something wrong and they take note. If they shouted all the time, it would lose effect. It's like swearing. You're not allowed to swear here. Anytime you can swear is in, in, in contact. So when something's going really badly wrong. So if anybody swears here, you know something's gone wrong. So how would you evaluate your, your leadership impact and your leadership success? Evaluate leadership success. Um, well, I think it goes, goes back to what we were talking about before about achieving the goals and tasks that you've, you've set yourself. Um, I think it also is about, um, you know, the climate in your organisation and, you know, whether, whether people are happy and content about what they're doing. And I, and I think that sounds a bit of a cliche, but I think that's really important. Um, so the two things, I think, you know, success, you know, if, you, if you're achieving goals, you're achieving your targets, you're achieving your aims, you do well in operations, you've got a good reputation, that breeds success and success, people like success, you know, and people do better if they're succeeding. So, you know, a leader's got to, got to win, got to succeed. Um, that's the first thing. And then, you know, the culture of the organisation that you're in, if it's, if it's the right culture and people are content and happy and they've got success, then I think you've cracked it. So I think that's how, that's how I've always assessed my own leadership in an organisation is whether you get those two things right. What, what do you think the army looks for in its leaders? Um, that's, a really, that's a really big question because, of course, it depends on the different, different situations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the army obviously uh, sets, sets targets, sets goals for people going into jobs um, you know, in our, in our appraisal process, we sit down and we, 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 we talk through with our superiors a series of goals that we are achieving. That's how we're marked. That's how we're, we are assessed throughout our time in a, in a job, whichever job that is. It doesn't matter whether you're an officer or a soldier. That's, that's the process. So it's a very fair, it's a very fair uh, way of, of, of marking your outputs, let's call it that. But in terms of marking your leadership, which is what we're talking about today, yeah. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced the army has, has, has ever really looked at that uh, as closely as perhaps it should. I think it's sort of assumed that you're going to be a good leader if you achieve the outputs. And I'm not sure that's always true because we have seen bad leaders that can still get good outputs because they are bad leaders and therefore they drive their people. They don't achieve the, the happy organisation. They'll, they'll achieve the success in the outputs, but they won't get, won't get the other bit right, but they still get rewarded. <laughs> And that's happened. That has happened. Um, although it's 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 been it's been um, been sorted out perhaps more recently. So, mar marking leadership in the army is something that I think is still still work in progress. Yeah. Um, and you know, over the last few years, there's been a lot of been a big drive to look at how we do that. And you know, things like 360 degree uh, reporting coming in, mentoring, coaching, all the things that you sort of assume we we were doing but we went, mm. are, are starting to come in now. And I think, you know, I think it's really important that we do. I think we really, it's really important that we do mark ourselves on our leadership and encourage people to check in on their leadership to make sure they are leading in the right way for, the, for their people and for the organisation. And if they're not, do something about it. You know, checking in is one thing, um, but once you've found out that you've got some blind spots or 
whatever it may be, then for goodness sake, do something about it and close, close the gaps. And if you don't, you should look for another job, quite frankly. I was, just, I was going on to ask you that because in any public sector organisation, moving people out through bad performance is really difficult. How would the, if you have those bad leaders who you've described, they may achieve the goal, they may get the success in the task that they've got immediately in front of them, but they, there will be a price to pay because they'll lose people, they'll lose that trusting uh, relationship. What can the army do about those people um, if, if they observe that actually the lead, that they're achieving their success but the leadership is going wrong? What would the army do? Well, I mean, I can't speak for the army now because I'm, I'm not in the army anymore. But I think, I think you know, the army is a fantastic organisation that I, I think does, does allow people to, to adapt and improve. You know, they do tolerate failure. Uh, and as long as you improve, mm. then they will, they, will, they will back you. But, um, you know, I think, I think some, some leaders uh, who have got, let's call them toxic leaders. I know it's, a, it's an outdated phrase now, but it's, people understand what I'm talking about. You know, they will achieve success. They will achieve outputs. But what people don't see is the wake of destruction that they leave behind them. And sometimes people choose not to see that because these people are getting, getting results. There is no place for those sort of people in any organisation, I would suggest, but particularly not in ours, where we, we ultimately rely on trusting one another. Um, so, so firstly, they've got to be found. Mm -hmm. But I think the way you do that is that you you do have something like 360 degree awareness, so you can check in on your leadership. But I think you know you can't just do that and then say, oh, you know, you failed out. You go. It goes back to my point. You need some sort of process where people are held to account for their leadership if they are found wanting, as long as they do something about it and improve, that's fine. If they don't, and let's be honest, some toxic leaders will not be able to close those gaps yeah. because it's just not in their yeah. characters, then they should go. And if they don't choose to go, they should be to told to go because there's just no place for them in any organization, is there? Absolutely not, no. But it is, it is harder in a public sector organization it is. than it is in a commercial. And that, and that brings me to think about a, a transition because you mentioned you're not in the army now. You're embarking on a new career. Um, and part of that is leadership consulting. What will you bring from your experience into other organizations in terms of managing that kind of leadership and ensuring that it's, let's say, healthy leadership that's, that's happening there? Well, firstly, I don't think that the army is not the be all and end all of leadership. Um, and one of the things that the army uh, has got better at is learning from others and reaching out to other organizations and other sectors to see how they deal with leadership. So, you know, the army is not the only way of leading. However, it is a different way of leading, perhaps you could argue, uh, or it has different parts, different aspects to its leadership. So I, I think I bring, or anybody who's leaving the army brings a different perspective on leadership born of the fact that we've led in some different environments um, that are different in many ways, different challenges, different environment, different physical environments. And so we bring a different way, which I think is, should be hopefully refreshing to organizations because someone can come in with a new set of eyes and just perhaps suggest different ways of leading that have worked, won't necessarily work in all environments, but maybe worth trying. So I think that's, that's, what, I'm, that's what I'm looking at. And there are, there are things that we do very well that I think translate well into the commercial space or, or the sports space, wherever it may be. And what have, in the course of your career so far, and taking that forward, what elements from other organisations would you, would you have liked to have brought into the army? What, what good practices have you seen elsewhere that perhaps the army could learn from? Um, well, it's interesting. So we, we, um, we started a program a while ago, uh, which you're probably aware of, the Ford Institute, um, which, is a, which is an organization that takes young leaders, you know, from, you know, young leaders with potential from, from their organizations, puts them into a pot effectively, and they're given change challenges to look at. And, and so you've got people from different organizations thinking about the same leadership change challenge and coming up from different aspects. That's been brilliant. Yeah. It's been absolutely amazing. 
and we've picked up so much and they you know when they've come back into into the military they've brought back those ideas and we've been able to spread them around as best practice you know that's that's what we that's what we need to do more of because having just said we we have different leadership challenges and different leadership issues we do but we also have some very similar yeah. challenges to everybody else and for example diversity and inclusion uh, which I, I mentioned before there are many other organizations out there that are also you know struggling to lead in 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 the right environment so you know we've learned an awful lot from 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 other people um you know and, and things like empowerment i talked about there are organizations out there and i won't name them but there are organizations out there that do empowerment really really well who absolutely get it because they have to because they have to stay a step ahead of the opposition because it goes back to the bottom line so they're brilliant at it and actually we can learn a thing or two about that from them so there's many there's many um there's many examples I could give you, but I think I'll come back to the fact that we've got that, that willingness to go out there and learn, and that's the most important thing. It's keeping that open mind, and the Leadership Centre, which is just down the corridor here, you know, that's the hub for the army now in terms of reaching out to other organisations and encouraging the debate, and you know, it's give and take. It's absolutely give and take. Mm. And they do run an excellent conference each year that brings in that kind of thought leadership. Um, they do, and I, and I went on a conference. I was I was invited to a um, sports professionals uh, leading in sport conference out in South Africa a couple of years ago. Went out there as the army rep with business conferences in London. You know, just going and and, and sitting. I mean, one of the, one of the th one of the great examples from the commercial world that I think we we really learned from is the fact that the you know the horizon scanning, looking looking ahead, mm -hmm. particularly with technology increasing at such pace, digitization, looking ahead and, and understanding those leadership challenges that are coming 10 years down the road. Because you've got to start equipping, you know, young leaders for that now. Yep. You know, youngsters here need to understand that when they're commanding a battalion or brigade, it's going to be a lot of different leadership challenges. We need to be getting that in there now. Organizations are, are much better at that than us, perhaps, or better than the army. Brilliant, thank you. Who, who has or who does inspire you most in terms of leadership? Um, you mean now or throughout my career? Throughout your career or now or, you know? Well, it's, it's interesting because someone was talking to me the other day about men, the mentor, mentor program. Um, and it's it, relatively new for the Army to have a, a formalised mentor program. But of course, you've had a mentor program, we just haven't called it that. Mm -hmm. But it goes back to my earlier comments about my platoon sergeant when I first yeah. arrived in the uh, in the battalion um, you know that that starts here I mean your your mentor when you first arrive here is your platoon staff your your platoon commander and your platoon color sergeant you know they're your role models and you learn as much from just watching them lead and do what they do as you do from your books and your your tactics you know it's about that role model example. And I think that's, that's endured throughout my career. I've, I, as I said before, I've had some amazing uh, leaders um, and peers, I mean, amazing people who I, have, who I have learned from. And I think as long as you have the humility to listen uh, and not assume you know it all, then you've got these, these, these mentors all around you and it's just a question of you know, picking the right ones to, to learn from. Um, so, um, I think you know I've, I've I've had some amazing people in some in some really difficult circumstances who have you know stood tall and and been that example. I think now if you ask me who's inspiring me at the moment, I'll just be you know bear in mind this today we've just found out there's a there's a uh, the the vaccinations fit for purpose is going to be rolled out. But I think you know hats off to some of these senior leaders who've had to step up yeah. over COVID. And I look at like, you know, Mr. Whitty, Chris Whitty, is it on TV? Professor Chris Whitty. Professor, beg your pardon, Professor, sorry, Chris, Professor Chris Whitty. I mean, you know, hats off to him because yeah. he's, I can't imagine the pressure that he's been under and, and cast into the limelight pretty, pretty quickly. I probably didn't, even he probably didn't see this one coming. Mm -hmm. To go in front of the nation's cameras night after night, mm -hmm. answer questions, be held to account for everything, good or bad. You know, to to be to be the right hand man really for the uh, for the major decision maker, and to do it what he and he's had a lot of stick as well um, from all sorts of people and in, in informed people, but he's been pretty inspirational, I would say. Mm -hmm. That's off to him. Hope he gets hope he gets a big reward for it. 
Yes, um, I absolutely agree with you there. And it's probably a position that he would not have asked for. No, I'm sure, well. Thrust into that position. <laughs> I probably, probably won't be asking for it again, I should think. But, but um, yeah, hats off to him. He's, uh, he's been inspirational. Indeed. Thank you. Um, in leadership, things sometimes go wrong. Yeah. How do you deal with the unintended consequences of what you do when things do go wrong? So I've I've had to um, I've had to I've had to learn that because I'm not particularly good at that. I'll be honest with you, and I've had to learn how to control it because I'm a I tend to think I tend to act first, think second. That's just the way I am. I've had to you know to um, sort myself out because of, because I've got that, and I think I've. You know, this this place teaches you to uh, to take a knee, to to um, to think, to take a moment, to think through um, what's got what's just happened um, before you act, and I think that's really that's really important. And I don't always follow that, but in the heat of the moment, when things have gone wrong, when there are unforeseen consequences of, of a decision you've made or or an action you've taken, you've got to think it through before you make a ne the next decision. Um, and so, what we get taught, what we get taught, is that uh, you know, take a knee means, you know, something goes bang, something goes wrong. Um, you know, you are the leader. So, what decision you are going to make next is going to have second, third, fourth order effects, consequences, particularly on those people around you. Mm -hmm. So, it's really important that you buy yourself thinking space as much as you possibly can. Now, of course, you may have to make an instant decision, in which case you've just got to go for it and rely on your instinct. But nine times out of 10, you do have time, even if it's only a short amount of time, to take a knee. And that means physically getting out of the way, mm -hmm. letting, letting the rest of the team deal with whatever's going on, while you just take a moment to think. So you're not acting with the passion of what's just happened. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you've got to think through a problem, you've got to think to the finish and think about the consequences and you know, go through, go through a, a system, whatever that system may be, of thinking through it, and then act. So sorry, long-winded answer to your question, but I, I've, had to, I've had to teach myself that, because you know, it's things like you get, a, you, get an, uh, you get an email from someone that you don't really like, you know, and, and gosh, I've learned now I'm far better if I don't reply immediately, yeah. but I, if I've got time, go, go for a run or do something, or just buy yourself that reflection time, that thinking time, you, you, you put a far better answer together. Yes than you do in the heat of the moment. And everybody, you know, everybody out there will know that. And I think you've just got to be, be disciplined about how you do that. And I'm not, and I've had to learn that. Mm. Well, are there any examples that you could give us of, of times when that's happened that you've had to deal with the, the consequences? Um, well, there's a, good, there's, a good, there's a good one in the book about um, where I did, I did pause. And that was because I had some really good people around me who, who were giving me advice. But on, a, on an operation where we were, we were, we were, we were leading um, the organisation, so we were at the front uh, of it. There's nothing else in front of us apart from the enemy, or so we thought. And it was night time. It was quite difficult conditions, and we saw vehicles uh, approaching us, and it's the enemy. So. We need to we need to fire. We need to get get uh, you know to start start taking action. And something in the back of my mind said, we just need to perhaps think about this. And one of the other guys said, you need to think about this. Let's just give it another few minutes and just make sure. So we did, and we asked and checked to make sure there's nothing else out there. No, there's nothing else out there. It's got to be the enemy. But something else, someone else said, no, let's just give it a bit more time. Let's just think it through. And sure, surely, as we as they emerged from the murk, and we got more sights on, they were they were our own people. They just got lost and had uh, were coming from some other different direction. So, just that taking a pause, not not reacting in the heat and the passion of the moment, which would have been very easy to do, um, saved lives. Very interesting that several of you had that instinct to pause. Yeah and think, I wonder what it was that just gave you that feeling. Just something not quite right, or whatever it may be. But again, it's, it's getting about relying on your team and you know, they, 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 uh, they gave me some great advice. Are there any 
decisions that you've made that you regret or or dwell on that you could have made better decisions? Uh, I'm sure lots. I'm sure if any of my soldiers are watching, they'll be reminding me over the uh, over the airways of some bad decisions I've made. Um, I mean, I made I made a well. I'll, I'll, I'll share I'll share two with you. Um, one was was a was a soldier in my unit who I'd I'd served with for for many years, and he was a good friend of mine, and we'd been on operations together, and we'd just come back from operations, and he went on leave, and um, got into a fight in a nightclub, drunk, and seriously hurt uh, another 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 person, a civilian, seriously hurt, put him in hospital with with serious head injuries and uh, came back to the battalion and was going to court. And we always get as commanding officer, we're always asked, you know, do you want to keep this man? Would you, would you support him and keep him? And I, because um, I knew him and he was a good bloke and, you know, we'd served together in some difficult circumstances. I said, yeah, we'll keep him. And I sent it up the chain of command and my boss ran me up and said, are you sure you want to do this? Is he a good bloke? Does a good bloke go and do this sort of thing. And I, and I had to think about it and actually he was right. You know, there is no, you know, he doesn't, he crossed the line. He had, he had betrayed our trust. Yeah. And for whatever reason I had, um, I made a bad call, which in, which in the consequences of that were I'd let myself down cause I'd lowered my own standards and therefore, you know, possibly the standards within the unit because people would have thought actually the boss is a soft touch. So, so, um, yeah, I regret that one. So just reflecting on your time in the army, yeah. what would you say was your best leadership capability? I hope it's been honest with, uh, with my people. Yeah. And I think uh, I've, tried to, I've tried to be honest as much as I possibly can with them. Because I think if you are, if you are truthful and honest with them and just tell them uh, exactly what's going on or you know, don't hide bad news. Just, just tell it how it is. Be straight with them. Yeah, yeah. Then they'll, they'll respect that. And I think, you know, we've mentioned trust so many times tonight, today. But I think that's huge, that's a huge part of trust. If they believe you, believe what you're saying, then they'll, they'll go to the ends of the earth. Sort of changing, changing tack a little bit. Um, the army now and organisations are much more global in their scale. But we tend to operate on a much more global, a globally influenced scale. Yeah. Um, and that brings in issues that you mentioned before about equality, diversity, um, education, poverty, climate issues. How do you think that leadership, and particularly army leadership, can embrace those concepts and build it into what they do better? Um. Well, they, they, they've got to work at it and, um, and bring it into our culture without a shadow of a doubt. And, and I'll, if I pick diversity out of that list you gave me, because I think it's the one that's you know, closest to my heart because of, of my last job here. Um, you know, we, 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 we've, we've had issues with diversity like a number of organizations have. And, and the, the bottom line is we've got to be better because it's the right thing to do, first and foremost but also because we're missing out on so much talent. Um, and you know, if, these, if these complicated problems we're facing now require diversity of thought, then you need to get that diversity in the front end. Um, and, and we haven't been doing that as well as we could. You know, I keep pointing to Santos, but 11% female. Yeah. That's not right. We should be a lot more than that, so we're missing out on a lot of talent. So I think about five years ago, the, uh, the, the, the Chief of the General Staff then, now, now the CDS, decided that we needed to really focus in on making sure that our behaviors, our culture was, was, was better so we could, we could start to improve. And it was about behaviors. It was about, um, you know, changing culture. And culture is all about values, behaviors, and making sure that, that that's consistently, consistently uh, um, followed. So we had, we had the values, um, we had the values, the army have six, six core values, but they weren't, really, they weren't really well understood by people, if I'm honest with you. People could list them, 
but they didn't know how did that, how did that, what does that mean to me? And what does it mean to the organization that we have courage or we have self-respect? You know, what does self-respect mean um, in, in terms of behaviors? So we did a lot of work in terms of trying to change the culture. And that was all down to, you know, behaviors. And so we did a number of things and it, it, things like we, 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 we pulled in a, a leadership code, which was effectively, you know, translating those values into leadership behaviors and holding self and others to account for, for, for those leadership behaviors. Um, we, we wrote a leadership doctrine for the first time ever, which, which basically codified what it meant to be an army leader and therefore why those behaviors were important and why it was really crucial that you you led by the values and you stuck to the standards and all that sort of thing. And then the third thing was creating the Center for Army Leadership, yeah. um, which we already talked about, which creates this amazing hub that, that incentivizes and professionalizes the study of leadership. So all those things um, were focused on behaviors and back to diversity. If you get the lived experience right, so people, doesn't matter what your background or your sex or color of your skin, doesn't matter. If you're treated fairly in the right way, in the lived experience, then you'll join. And that's what, that's what a cultural shift is all about. It takes time. It takes real leadership, top, top down, and, and CGS absolutely got amongst it, and therefore everybody else did. And bottom up, you know, get the youngsters involved, then it will, it will change. Um, and it's, it's changing, it's not there yet, but we are a heck of a long way down the road. And, um, and so, we'll so you know, when we talk, start talking about climate, I know the, the powers that be are very interested in, in, um, in, in, in looking at um, you know, climate uh, change and, and um, you know, resilience and all those sort of things that are coming in now. That will happen as well, because now we've got a, we've got a, a way of doing it, a way of changing culture that we can apply to anything. And I've read the leadership doctrine, obviously, um, because of the, the work that I've been doing yep. with you. Um, and a lot of that is very translatable into non-military organisational life. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that as you move into a, a non-military life as a leadership um, consultant? Well, I think, first of all, first of all, it was designed as a framework to, to, to base to base your leadership on. It wasn't, it wasn't the finished product, it's, it's the foundation as it were. Yeah. It's live, so it's, it's constantly getting updated. So you know, depending on which part of the army, you know, that's, your, that's your foundation, but then you build on you know, your, your, your own particular style of leadership or you know, whatever organization you're in will have its own way of leading, that's fine. So it's, it can be adapted, but it's the foundation which we didn't have before. So everybody knows fundamentally what, it, what we all need to be to be an army leader. Um, but that, that framework, I think, absolutely can translate into, because it's just, it's that, it's that enduring nature of leadership, mm -hmm. which I think every, any organization will see, will resonate with, um, I think. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 I mean, in my last job in the, uh, in the military, uh, one of my, one of my roles was, was recruiting. So I worked a lot with, um, with Capita, you know, a civilian organization. Uh, we had a joint operation. And um, you know it, it, we had quite a significant challenge, and the way we approached that challenge was was through you know doing doing quite a lot of stuff from the leadership doctrine. So it works in not just a military context, and I can prove that because we we uh, we succeeded. So yes, it is transferable, not for everybody, but large chunks of it I think will be. What are or is the leadership myth that annoys you the most? <sighs> Um, I think I think the uh, I think one of them is that you know you can you can sort of get leadership on a course. It's a it's a sort of one off a one off hit. Uh, I've done my two weeks and therefore that's me. I'm a leader and then you can sit back and assume assume leadership from then on. I think there are people out there who think that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's that's one that's one myth that I think people need to understand, which I think most people do, that it's a journey that you need to keep working at it. Um, so that's that's probably the that's probably the biggest one I think. And then just because we were talking about it before, and I will get it out there. I think um, you know the, one of the leadership myths is about Santos. This place used to annoy me incessantly. 
was the fact that, you know, it's all about privilege, that to come to Sandhurst, you have to have come from the right background, the right school, the right university, which is absolute rubbish. It's, it's about potential. If, you, if you've got that leadership potential, you can come to Sandhurst and you can be an army leader and you can be an army officer. No one, no one genuinely cares about, you know, where you came from um, in terms of, um, you know, that side. It's about potential. So that's, that's another myth that really annoyed me, which is one of the reasons we wrote the book. One of the reasons we wrote the book was to dispel that myth about who comes here. Um, and, you know, hopefully we've done that. And when I first came here, that was one of the things that really impressed me the most was the, the huge variety of backgrounds that the officer cadets came from and that any one of them, wherever they were from, could be a major general um, in their future career. Absolutely. And the, the playing field was then level for anybody to achieve their best potential. Absolutely. Yeah, and I definitely, I absolutely 100% believe that. If you've got what it takes, the army will find it and will reward you. So what do you think other organisations can learn from that? Well, I think, I think it's, about, it's about growing leaders, isn't it? I think, I think um, this is a sweeping generalisation. So, uh, but I think quite a lot of organisations out there assume leadership and assume that you know, people will come into an organisation based on their specific capabilities in a particular line of business. And as they get promoted through the organisation, will emerge as a leader, a senior leader one day without any, you know, they'll, they'll, just, they'll just get it. Um, and I just don't think that's the case. I think you've got to, you've got to have, any organization has got to have a system for growing its own leaders. Mm -hmm. And whether that's a development course or a, a, a system of mentoring or whatever it may be, there's got to be something in there. And I think the army does that. It's not perfect, don't get me wrong, but I think it gives it a really good shot. I, mean, I I come from a originally from a healthcare background, and now having observed this happening in the in the army quite closely, um, those two organisations do very well at building people up as they they go, and it's something that I've observed doesn't happen as much in um, other public sector organisations, and particularly private sector organisations yeah. that don't build people up. Yeah as they go along, you know, the see one, do one, teach one kind of model. You don't touch the, the front line until you've had some practice behind the scenes. Um, what do you think, what do you think that private sector organisations can learn from that sort of model? Well, I'm not, I'm not an expert on it, but I think, I don't know about, you know, I think what the army can't do is buy in, buy in leaders. Yeah. You, know, you can't buy in a, a, a major general, um, you know, from outside because, the culture is you've got to come up through and understand the context and all that sort of, that sort of thing. Whereas civilian organisations can. But I think it's quite expensive to bring people in. I think it's quite expensive to, to keep um, recruiting people for specific roles. So um, having, having a system that, as I say, grows, grows your leaders, that, that, that nurtures your talent, uh, your leadership talent, so that you're growing your own senior uh, leadership. Mm -hmm. I haven't done the sums, but I suspect it might be quite cost effective. Uh, and I think some organisations automatically think leadership development is nice to have and it's too expensive, can't afford people to have time out. And I get that. But actually, I think if you did the cost benefit analysis, you know, in time, you get you get significant payback. And also it breeds loyalty to the, to the team, to the organisation. You know, if you invest in people, invest in their development, they're far more likely to stay with you. And uh, well, AHEP's a classic case. You know, when we said when we said at the beginning we're going to give give um, people the opportunity to gain, you know, uh, academic credits yep. for going through their career, and they'll eventually get a master's. Everyone said, "Well, as soon as they get a master's, they'll leave." That's not been the case. They feel invested in, they do. and they feel that when they do choose to leave, then they can they've got the, they've got the right qualifications to um, you know to to make it in Surrey Street alongside what their mates have got. So. I don't, I don't buy that argument. I think if you invest in people's professional development, they'll repay it in, in spades. We certainly hope so. Um, so the, the AHEP programmes, the de degree programmes that the officers do yeah. um, with Henley Business School and the University of Reading, yeah. um, we hope will inspire them to be 
better at their jobs, be better officers and take that through their careers uh, rather than equip them to go somewhere else. Um, but it also keeps them in line with their city street contemporaries who have gone on to do other things. They have got the same um, self-belief that they've got those qualifications. But, but I also think you know, with, the, with the Ahab's a classic case where there's something else to aim for. Mm-hmm. So you, you come in, you come in, come in as a non-graduate, you get your bachelor's within four years, but then you say, well, actually, if I stay on a bit longer, I can get a master's. Mm-hmm. And then I might, might think about doing an MPhil or something like that. And, and you're constantly improving your own um, credibility, mm-hmm. competence, whatever you want to call it. At the same time, doing it alongside your day job. So you're getting rewarded for doing your day job. I and mean, that's got to be a nice thing to have, isn't yeah. it? I'm sure organisations can do that. And the two work in parallel because yeah. you're, you're continuing with your, your critical thinking and that that development alongside your day job yep. and so the two are hand in hand um, together yeah so what's the one question or challenge about leadership or leadership development um, that you would like the Henley Centre of Leadership to take on board um, it's one that I've been thinking about and I'm doing some work on but I think and I've been talking to quite a lot of people about you know, leading in crisis because we are in a crisis and you know how do you how do you lead um, you know, disparate teams? How do you uh, lead at range? How do you cope with isolation? All the all the pressures that are on organisations now as we cope cope with COVID. I think the thing that people aren't thinking about, perhaps as well as they should, is is how do you what happens when this finishes? How do you reset the organisation? How do you um, reset leadership to cope with what comes next? And I think what, the, what, the, what we've been used to for years in the army is that we go away on operation for six months or a year, whatever it may be. We go as an organization. We then come back as an organization. We then have to reset. After having been through something quite significant, we then have to reset, get ourselves sorted out, rebuild the team, and then crack on aiming at the next crisis or the next operation that's going to be around the corner. Mm. That's the sort of mindset I think organizations need now to start thinking about and I think Henley could um, you know could could start thinking about that as well yes and you say getting ready for the next crisis because there surely will be one I don't think we've right. seen the end of these kind of crises it's yeah. perhaps the first of of many and so being agile with our leadership learning might be a, a good thing and, and also it really examining what happened in the last crisis you know, when we come back off, a, off an operation, we have a post-operational report that goes into minute detail, everything that we did to, to, to drag out the lessons. And then it's, you know, we, we say it's lessons identified because you haven't learned them until you actually learn them. Mm-hmm. So it's lessons identified. Then it's about how do you, how do you, you know, bring them into the organization? How do you adapt how you do things to, to take note of the lessons in time for the next crisis? So there's, there's quite a bit to think about there. And I think that's just, that's just you know, and we've got to think about leadership as well, I think, in that. You know, how do you lead out of this? Thank you. And another aspect of the Henley Centre for Leadership is that we engage in research. Um, but it's research to inform practice. Are there any areas, what are the areas that you can see where we could be doing research that could inform practice? For the future, what what do we need to know more about? This is a bit a bit of a left the field one, but but we um, I think you might have been on the conference, but you know I think organisations like yours should be doing the horizon scanning and looking forward at the emerging challenges that are facing us. Yeah. And I I just got this scratch about artificial intelligence and leadership and. And it's not going to be too long now mm-hmm. where we start to see robots um, in the workplace. And as I said to cadets here, it won't be too long now before half your platoon, your, half your team could be artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. And what are the implications? Because the leader, I'm assuming the robots can't lead. Well, that may be the wrong assumption, but the leader is still going to be a human. Mm-hmm. But it's going to have to, he or she is going to have to deal with a we're talking a really diverse team now because yeah. you know you've got you've got uh, AI involved in that as well. What are, what are the leadership challenges that are going to be 
in play then. I mean, we're sort of starting to see that now with, with drones and, and robot sentries and things like that, you know, things that are out there already, they're keeping the man in the loop and all that sort of terminology. But I don't think it's really thought about leadership challenges, perhaps. So that maybe that's one thing, I'll, mm. you know, that horizon scanning piece. And AI is not just in things that will go and do stuff, but it's embedded in the equipment that we use. And so leadership might be about using that equipment better to allow the humans to do better. Yeah, yeah. So that's there's an, a, a, a big piece of work being done there about how we use the, the smart equipment to allow us humans to do our jobs better and so that it's not actually a threat to our jobs, it just enables us to do what we do even better. And for, for the army, I mean, I would think that that's quite an important yeah. aspect of, of how we approach keeping the peace in the world and reconstruction and administering COVID tests and mobilising people and all of those kind of things. Is there anything else that occurs to you in that, in that time? No, um, not off the top of my head, but I mean, what you're saying there about, I mean, I think, again, we've seen a, we've seen a glimpse of that, haven't we, with, with the COVID and, and how we've been managing IT and you know, how we've had to adapt our leadership to cope with leading people at distance, leading people through Zoom or Teams. And I think that's, that's had an effect on, on leaders and leadership. Um, some have coped really, really well. Others, others have struggled. Um, but I think everyone's learned something from it. Um, and I think, you know, going forward, going to your, your excellent point, you know, there's some massive opportunities here in terms of how we do things. But there are also some threats in terms of, you know, you don't, you don't want to go, you, you don't want to forget, you don't want to throw the baby out because there are some good things that we did. You know, it was quite good being able to meet around a table and talk through things. It was quite good to be able to, you know, look, look someone in the eye and have that physical contact. So you don't want to lose that. Yet the ability to have more people on your Zoom, to have a more inf all informed net, mm. you know, sped up decision making mm. significantly. So. You know, I think that's a that's a really interesting aspect as we come out of this is that that sort of you know I've already talked about the lesson identified process yes. to work out what was good, what wasn't, and and you know do something with it, which isn't just yeah we're all going to sit at home now and work on our computers at home because that's not the answer I don't think there's somewhere in the middle. And definitely things that you can't do doing meetings endlessly on Zoom. Um, whether we'll learn whether the, the software will learn um, to be able to do that. Just getting around a table, around a table with a, a whiteboard and, and brainstorming things and writing stuff up and sharing and all, all of that kind of thing is much more difficult to do on Zoom. Whether they'll enable, you know, you can use whiteboards, I don't know. For me, that hasn't worked particularly well. Yeah. But I also think the way, and I'm sort of going, I'm going very off-piste here, Tom. Um, I think the way leadership has been enacted has really sorted uh, um, the, the wheat from the chaff in terms of leaders over this, because some leaders have been absolutely brilliant at keeping in touch with their teams, making sure that people are okay, that they're coping with lockdown, um, their resilience is all right, that whether they need stuff. I mean, uh, some people have even been, you know, going out and leaving things on folks' doorsteps to make them feel better. And others have just pretend, buried their heads in the sun and pretended it's all not happening and just left people. Oh, well, they're, they're not in the office, they're somewhere else, let them just get on with it. Yeah. I mean, have you, have you any thoughts about leadership enacted in that kind of way? Well, I think you made a really good point there, and I think I think the, the basics still apply, don't they? You know, the enduring nature of leadership mm. absolutely implies uh, applies uh, whether you're sitting face to face or whether you're a thousand miles apart. You've still got to have that presence. Yeah. You've still got to inspire hope. You've still got to look after people. All those sort of things. You just got to do it in a different way. I think some people may have forgotten that, but then also I think you've got to. Uh, I mean, I'm like you. I don't know how to do whiteboard on a Zoom. That's my fault. I need to upskill myself as a leader because I've, I should be able to do that by now. And so I think there's this, um, it goes back to self-awareness, doesn't it? And, and checking in on yourself. And you know, this, is a, this is a real, we call it a question four moment in the army, but this is a real, one of those moments where you've got to look at yourself and say, was I, 
was I equipped as a leader to be able to deal with that situation? And if the answer is not really, then you've got to look at, well, what do I need to do now to make sure that when this happens again, or if this endures, uh, how, how can I you know, lead? So I think, I think it's been a common thread through the conversation that you know, self-awareness, knowing yourself, doing something about your leadership, blind spots, whatever it may be in any context, is, is hugely important. And this is just another one. I am, you know, I, one of the best things I did in my, in, in my last few years in the army is I got myself a reverse mentor because I'm of a different generation to the youngsters coming yeah. through now. So the way I write, the way I do things doesn't necessarily, you know, connect with them in the way that they want to be connected with. So I got myself a reverse mentor and advice from someone else. I got myself a young female officer who would give me advice on stuff. You know, if I was writing something, she would tell me whether it was the right thing to write or is it, it was in the right way of writing that would connect. That's the sort of, that's the sort of approach we all need now um, if we're gonna connect with you know, this generation coming through, but also the, the, the IT aspects. You know, we need to, we're of a different generation. We need to understand what's happening now. One, one of the kinds of people that worries me the most in a leadership context are the people who refuse to build their self-awareness. People who have a limited amount of self-awareness and know it can build that up. They can spot where their implicit biases are, they can deal with them, they can see where the holes are in their technical knowledge or whatever. But if you've got any individuals, particularly in a leadership position, whose self-awareness is so minimal that they don't know what they are really bad at and refuse to even think about it, how would you deal with people like that? Um, well, there's, there's the education bit first. I mean, they need, to, they need you need a bit of a courageous conversation with them to sit down and say, you need to sort yourself out because you can't lead unless you do get a bit more self-aware and do something about it. And I think it goes back to the point I said before, and if, if those people are, if those people genuinely can't see that they have issues that they need to close with, I'm not sure they should carry on doing what they're doing. Would be my, would be my view. I mean, there's, there comes a line in the sand, as I not, with leadership where if people refuse to change and it's, 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 it's not achieving anybody's aims, then something's got to give. Would be, would be my view, but you've got to give them opportunities to improve, and that's that's the bit that that um, you know. I think people have got to put put a bit of thought in is is the and it goes back to the bit about development, isn't it? And giving them access to development. You can't assume people know all this stuff if you haven't taught them, if you haven't allowed them the space to develop themselves. So, giving them the room to improve, to develop, has got to be the first step. But if they if they get that and still refuse to do it, then that's that's the second step, isn't it? So um, we're drawing to a close now. So I'd like to end on a, um, an optimistic and, and positive note. What does your future leadership look like? My future leadership? I don't know because I'm, I'm not there yet. It'll, 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 it'll probably, uh, whatever, whatever I end up doing, I'll have to adapt my leadership to, to, to deal with that environment. Um, I, I think I will retain a lot of what I've learned over the last 34 years, uh, particularly the, the the enduring nature. I think the enduring nature of army leadership, as we've talked about before, is is good to go. And I think it's a good basis for whatever I go on to next. But I will, will keep an open mind and understand that I'll have to adapt my style to, to deal with either the organization I'm part of or the environment that I'm operating in. And, and as long as I keep that open mind, I should be okay. Brilliant. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.